All right, let's go. So we are at the point of bees in the box to box full grown, and we should be at a full grown state, right? I mean, bad one. This, this image represents. Are you, are you muted? Uh, I muted him. <laughs> this image represents you put a package in a hive, and the first thing the hive does is it gets instantiated and they start to build brood they have no resources they haven't been out foraging they have no honey or any of that stuff they start to grow and actually if you bought yourself a five frame nuke this is about the stage where you're at too they eventually join up to each other you just started a couple steps ahead they continue to grow you can see there's a little bit of honey storage starting to come in frames to the outside honey across the top and eventually they get to that first box is full with honey to the outside and you need to add a second box. When we discussed this earlier, we talked about this step. When you go to put the second box, take two frames out of your bottom box and center them in the top of the other box and put empty frames down in and do your swap and so on. So. We hope you did this, but if you didn't, you just put an empty box on top with foundation. That's okay. Either way, the bees figure it out. In the future, if you start a hive, though, this is what we would recommend because when you bring those uh, frames up, they help to draw the bees up into that cavity. It continues to progress. There's your hive with the new setup. It continues to build out. The bottom box is full. The top box is building. And eventually you get to two deeps. This is usually customary by mid-June, early July. If you started with a package earlier, if you started with a nuke. If you're lucky enough to get here, hopefully you all are, you get to this state where you start putting a honey super on. And ideally, you start to have them draw comb on your honey super. There are times, like 2021, for some people where they're going to put honey supers on, they're going to build that out, you're going to put another honey super, they're going to build that out, and you're actually going to get honey. Hard to say where, where you are, it's different because beekeeping is local. We'll suggest that you should at least be at this stage, ending with adding your first honey super at this point. So just a quick show of hands or, or a quick chat. How many of you are here with hives that you started new this year? Yeah, okay. Me too. So good. In the chat, is there anybody that's not here? Just out of curiosity. Added a super last week for Anthony. Good. Okay, for the most part, we'll, we'll get to that because I'm going to literally come to each one of you. But eventually, this might have happened, right? You, you're going to get here, and you're going to have to learn how to honey harvest, which is a rather interesting thing for the first year. And it's not out of the question, but it does happen. Uh, we could talk to that. And if you, if you have questions about honey harvest, ask at the end. That being the case, you all have full-size hives, then you have to be in the full-size beekeeper mentality of knowing what varroa mites are. Most of you, when you bought your colonies, whether they were a package or they were a nuke, were treated ahead of time. They probably should have started life with a low dynamic of mites. But now that they're out there and the population has occurred inside the colony, not only did your bees grow, but so did any of the mites that were there. Now, Varroa mite is always in the hive, and they're always in on the bees. One of the things that I, this is the sciences I'm going to get. You can learn a lot about Varroa mite when you go to classes and so on. And if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But in order to keep this moving along, I'm, I'm not going to go crazy about it. But scientifically, one of the things that's really interesting about Varroa mite is they go underneath the, in between the seams on the underside of the bee, and they latch on to the fat body which is a layer of fat that is inside the shell of the outer membrane of the bee. They also do suck on some hemolymph, which is the fluid inside a bee equivalent to blood inside of us. 
what they're after there is they get the nutrition from the fat body, which is a layer of fat and proteins, but they also get something called an egg yolk precursor because varroa mites, when they lay their eggs and, and spawn, they can't make that product. So they're so dependent upon the bee that that's one of the things they're after. Now, I say this all the time, it's my favorite way to describe it. You tell two friends and they'll tell two friends and they'll tell two friends. That's the way Varroa mites grow. I have a friend who said, if the aliens ever landed, we're already behind because they got here. And if there's something that outbreeds us as human beings, we'll lose because the thing that outbreeds always wins. Well, in the case where explosive group brood, brood growth occurs, mites are winning, right? And you may not see them, but they're there. Now the mites favor the brood. This is where we start to talk about how you can figure out the mite problem inside your colony. They're riding around on the nurse bees on the underside and the nurse bees are going in to feed the young. And once the nurse bees get to uh, bees that are almost to the age of capping, the females hop off and they go inside the cell and get capped over. The bad thing is they go in there and they injure the bee that's in the cell. They've also injured the bee that dropped them off. They've wounded them and they potentially contaminated them with viruses. So for us, it's a double whammy, Varroa mite or the scourge of our entire operation. Now, they go into the worker brood, but they'll also go into the drone brood. And biologically, it seems they favor the, the drone brood or do better in the bro drone brood. And the reason being is worker brood takes 21 days. Drone brood is a little bit longer. That little extra time for development for the drone allows the mite to propagate more bees. So you always hear that a mite will propagate 1.3 to 2.6 mites every time they go into a cell. Why is that number different? It's because the time difference between worker and uh, drone brood. So this is what the mite population dynamic looks like. It goes in, it goes through six days, it lays its egg, a male comes in, the thing gets fertilized and she lays more eggs. And you can see that eventually when the bee emerges, this is where the 1.3 to 2.6 females exit. And now you have even more population. And this is the I tell two friends and they tell two friends and they tell two friends and so on growth. You can imagine over a period of time where mites are producing 1.3 to 2.6 mites per bee that emerges. If you have 10,000 bees and it goes to 30,000 bees to 50,000 bees, we'll multiply that by 1.3 and 2.6 and you'll know how many mites you're gonna have. So it stands to reason that if you started with a low mite threshold in the beginning, not a lot, by the time summer comes and the hives that have the, the biggest population are booming, they're infested with mites. And if you wait too long, your hive is going to be toast because of all the impacts. So, so healthy colonies implode. They implode. I have this theory, and it's starting to show up in the research, called the Supreme Hive, which is the biggest hives suffer the worst load and there's a researcher from maryland who says the varroa mite problems hiding in plain sight it's in our strongest colonies and what happens is the ratio is so out of balance that the entire colony is sick because it's impacted by a plethora of varroa mites and somewhere down the road, we'll talk to you about making splits and divides and getting that colony population down or stopping, you know, your varroa mite uh, strategies to try and prevent that. But so what, what do we do? Do we just let it happen? Of course not, right? We need to know when what they call the economic threshold, that's the scientific term for it, occurs. It means economically 
the bees will suffer and stop producing when they're harmed. In this case, the varroa mite are going to damage the bees. Sometimes they'll just completely wipe them out. And by the time fall comes, they're so laden with viruses and pests, they abscond and the colony literally collapses out to nothingness, right? But if you monitor and you determine that the threshold is to the point where it will do harm, then you could take action before they're overcome. And that's what might dynamics might monitoring is all about right and this is why if you hear anything you're going to hear tonight you need to monitor early in the summer that explosion growth leads to the high population of mites and some people wait till august or september it's too late the entire colony is impacted damaged they can't recover they're not going to make it june July at the latest. If you wait till August 1st, you're really playing roulette. So you need to go out and monitor, you know, now. Now, you guys started with new colonies that were treated in the beginning, so you got to leg up. But, you know, technically in the future, when you have a full-size colony that came out of winter and it gets to June, you should be doing something with it. That's that's really important for you to understand for next year. Don't wait till July, August. Full size colonies coming out of winter, they almost need to go in May to be monitored. And if you listen to the Honeybee Health Coalition and some of the other experts like Bee Informed Partnership, they want you to monitor every month. And whenever you get to the point where you're at the threshold, you should correct it. There's a lot of really good information on scientific beekeeping with Randy Oliver about this mite growth dynamic, but I'm hoping you got the gist of it all and I'm going to move on. If you look at this picture, you see mites on the backs of the bees. That's a unicorn picture. That's a bad sign. If you're opening your colony and you're seeing Varroa mite on the backs of your bees, it means there's so many of them that they're riding around in plain sight. It's not typical. They're usually down underneath the bee and in between the folds. That's where they go in. Look up the information from Sam Ramsey about how the varroa might feed, and you'll see the pictures very clearly in the cross sections and so on. So just out of curiosity, if you're looking through your hive and you say to yourself, look, there's a varroa mite on a bee, that's a that's a odd thing to see but it should also be a warning sign to you um you 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 see bees with varroa mites on them you probably have a problem and you need to do some monitoring and testing now this is the time when i talk about june july you need to start switching to even though the first day of summer was june 20th the winter mindset I always feel like August 1st to October 31st is that time period where the bees are going to be doing generations of young bees that will eventually switch over and become winter bees. Winter bees biologically are a little bit different than the regular everyday summer bee, that they store fats in their biological makeup changes so that they can survive over winter. That starts to occur late summer, early fall, but it's the queen's health and the nurse bee's health that create generations of bees that are healthy enough to bring you through that window. And this is the time that you need to monitor for your mites, but also make sure that you have good brood patterns that you feed the bees so that they're all that they can be. And we'll talk about summer management and that you get your treatments done early so that, you know, one of the things I've not talked about is when the mites overwhelm their vectoring viruses and wounds on all the bees and those bees are sick, your entire colony is sick and you could literally see it and sometimes it manifests into problems which i'll show you in a moment right so you don't you don't want your entire colony walking dead sick right 
have to take corrective action at the right time. So August through October, you got to think about this. If it takes 21 days for a bee to emerge, then how many of those 21 day segments do you have from August to November and to get to winterization? There's about four to five generations of bees that become the winter bees. You, you need to, yeah, I'm going to continue to emphasize this. This is what you need to do is make sure that these bees end up being healthy. If you want your colony to survive, you got to take action now. And that's why when we talk about mentor visits, we're going to come out now. We're going to come out in the beginning of July, monitor your hives for you and with you, and make sure that we get some treatments on. There are dozens of occurrences where I could tell you someone came and told me their hive perished or looks sick or is not going to make it through winter or died in January and February. And it's because they waited till September to treat or do anything. I'll pause on this slide and tell you, you need to write this URL down and you need to be familiar with the Honeybee Health Coalition. When it comes to managing Varroa mite, they've got the Bible. This tools for Varroa management is everything you need to do. In fact, I never tell people how to treat, like how to use product and so on, because two reasons. One, I want you to go read the instructions. And two, I always read the instructions, even though I've been using these products for years and years and years, and I could tell you how to put Formic Pro on or Apigard or some of these things. I try not to commit them to memory to force myself to read the instructions. If you want to be a successful beekeeper, you monitor frequently and you go and follow the rules for whatever they're telling you. Now, when we first started, 10 mites in a sample, no big deal. Now they're almost to the point of saying 1%, which is three mites, two mites in a sample, and you should be treating. That gauge has gotten far more conservative, and it has to do with the fact that the viruses vectored by the mites have become stronger and more impactful to the bees. If you followed the generation six years ago of advice, you're out of luck. So you got to stay with it. And the Bee Informed Partnership and the Honey Bee Health Coalition are your guides to follow and what the right recommendations are. Now, to the contrary of that, I'm going to say something strange. Well, you would think, well, I'm just going to treat then. If this is such a wreck, why would I do that? The problem is that the mites can avoid or can get resistance to the products, just like any anything else. That's why we don't willy-nilly take antibiotics. Apivar, which is one of our strongest weapons, our easiest weapons, our most available weapons, is starting to become resistant. And some of it, they say, has to do with how much of it we use because it is so convenient and widely available. In the context of we want these things available to us, that we should only treat when it warrants treating. You should monitor your thresholds, and if it's below the threshold, don't do anything. Just monitor again in a month and check it. All that information is in, excuse me, in this guide, so follow it. I'm going to actually talk about the process of mite monitoring, the physical mite monitor process. I want you to look at this frame for a second. I'll let you study it. Think about what you're seeing. Ignore the queen cells on the bottom. I want you to look at the brood pattern and what you're noticing here. The question I ask, is this a good frame? So what I'm going to talk about is when you go to pick a frame to monitor for Varroa mites, you typically pick a frame that is, not typically, you do, you pick a frame that is a brood frame. There's a lot of different frames that have brood on them, brood meaning bees being in development. The reason goes back to what we said before. The mites are riding around on the nurse bees looking to hop in a cell that's going to be capped. 
So what's going on with this one? In the case of this one, This was a full patch of brood that's been capped. Typically, the queen will lay from the center out. And if she laid from the center out, then it stands to reason that the center of the brood pattern would emerge first. So my sensibility would say that this hive is emerging from the center out and these are next. So this is not a place, unless the queen's already laid in here, where they're building bees. This is where bees are coming out. So is this a good place to pick for nurse bees? Hold that thought. How about this one? Are there nurse bees on a frame that's fully capped? There might be by serendipity, but the Varro might have no place to go. And while they might be riding around on the bees, there probably isn't a high concentration here because remember they're attracted to the bees that are going to the brood area and smell the pheromone that the brood is giving off. So the actual one earlier is better than this one. This one I think is a no-go. These are not nurse bees that you want to sample from. Now, if you look at this frame and sorry, it's a smidge blurry. This is classic brood in all stages. Remember what I said, the queen lays from the middle out. So you have the older developing bees in the middle. They're already C-shaped, they're plump, they're closed. They're just about to get to the point where they're capping them. If you can look at this, you'll see like vestiges of dark yellow where they're getting ready to close this off. And then it goes all the way out to eggs, all the way in the periphery. Is this a good frame to use? I shook the bees off it so you could see the brood. So there would be bees covering all of this. Maybe this, this might be a good one, but I only see this little tiny patch and the rest of them are eggs. So it might be a good one if it were covered, but I would keep looking. This is the one, this is the one I would choose. Is it a good one? If it's not perfect, it's going to be very soon. So let me explain what you're looking at. If you've looked at brood frames long enough, you will eventually see that the bees will set something up for the queen. There's nectar up in the corners. Some of it's being capped. There's probably pollen all the way around. And if you've ever heard any of my talks, I'd say about trust the rainbow, right? Because they put honey up in the corners and they surround with a ring of pollen to feed the brood and development. And the queen typically lays in this big batch in one or two days. And within days, this is all capped. This will be an entirely capped area soon. Now I can't see in the bottom and tell you if there's eggs or larvae in here, but I know that this is by far a really good candidate for a brood frame and that if the queen is laying in here, all the bees that are in this circle are nurse bees. So while the previous frame, if it were covered with bees, it'd be a good one. This one to me would be very appealing. I would look at this one and look at the age. Now, when do the Varroa mite go into the cell? Just about when they're gonna be capped. So if the brood in this circle is a little bit older, you can see plump, juicy C-shaped larva ready to turn to a pupa, then this is your frame. So the takeaway for this is look at your frames. There's a lot of people who will pull this frame, take the sample from it, get nothing in the sample, and then they're misled. That's the lesson. You need to make sure that when you select a brood frame, you understand what that means. You want one that's going to have brood where the, where the mites are going to be. Okay. Hopefully that's clear from everybody. I'm going to go into how to actually do mite monitoring. We recommend you use this device. It's called an easy check. You fill it with isopropyl alcohol, maybe a little bit of water, your choice. Eventually you'll dump the bees in. 
Now, I'm not going to show you a sugar shake. You could put sugar in here, meaning powdered sugar. But time and time again, when you talk to the researchers, they have proven that it's not an effective or as effective treatment or measuring device. And they almost universally tell you, do the alcohol wash. So we subscribe to saying, do the alcohol wash. Um, if you want to use powdered sugar, fine. They show you how to do that on the Honeybee Health Coalition. Select your brood frame, just the way I just described it. Look for the queen. Obviously, you don't want to sample your queen. So hopefully your queen is marked, but if she's not, two, three, four passes. If you do find the queen, take that frame and set it aside and pick another frame and just you'll be safe to know that you're not going to sample the queen. Now, sometimes it's easier said than done. Where's the queen? <laughs> she's still there. She's right there, but she's kind of under the clump. Now, they would tell you never to blow on bees. I do it all the time. If I have this big pile of bees, it is possible that the queen's going to be on it. And I just lightly blow on it and they'll separate and maybe the queen's going to show up. But the lesson here is look carefully. Now, let's go to Armageddon. You sample the queen. She's dead. You wiped her out. You have brood in all stages. And there's still plethora of drones in your hive in June and July. They'll make a new one. Will it be a setback? Yes, but it's not going to be the end of the world. If you're to the point where I can't find the queen, so I'm not going to sample, don't do that. Take your time, find the queen, call a friend if you have to, or just do the sample and I'll tell you a secret in a moment. So, you know, the queen could be hidden, look all over the place. Now, if you have a frame that looks like this, how do you find the queen? I can't find a queen in a frame like this. Ask me. I've done it a couple times. Your goal here, if you know this is a brood frame, is to get a half cup of bees, which is 300 bees. You don't need all these bees. Take your frame, even if it has the queen on it, hold it over the hive, and just give it a short shake. The bees will fall off, but so many bees will be maintained on the comb that you'll have 300 bees and pick the thing up and scan it again, and you'll have less bees to have to look through. So if you got so many bees on a frame that you can't find it, shake some of the bees in, just make sure that you maintain enough that you can do a sample, and again, you've picked the right one. Can you spot the drone? There's a couple of them in here. Here's one right here. See the eyes? You want to move your bees to your container. I'm using a flat little Tupperware dish here. The reason my hand is blurry is I've held the frame in a vertical format. I've brushed any bees off the end bar, and I take my hand and I wrap. Boom. When you do that, some bees will go in the air, but most of them will go and fall right down into this. You could also hold the ears and hold it horizontal and shake it down. But when you have a little container like mine, even a big container, the bees go all over the place. So wrap the bees off and put them down into the container. And then wait a second. If there's foragers in there, which there could be, most of the time they go, hmm, this isn't the hive, and they fly away. Nurse bees always stay inside. It's just the way they are. They're not inclined to get up and fly out a lot of them. Now you could look at this container now that the bees are all flat and in the container. Um, this is a clear one. Sometimes people use white ones. It makes it easier to see. And since they're all single layer, you can do one more check to see if you can find the queen. In the dozens of samples I've ever done, one time I found the queen doing that. She was laying in there. And I just picked her up by the wings and put her back on the hive. Now you have your bees. 
you need to get a sample of them, put them in your cup. So you take your half cup measure, you turn the bees and you bang them down to the bottom and to the corner, you see the big pile and you just get your scoop. This is not a dilly dally thing, right? You, you bang them, you tilt them, you scoop them and you put them right in. Bang, 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 right off the bat. In they go. Hopefully you get your full half cup. Now, as much as I say, be quick about it, don't be sloppy about it. If you did this measure and you have too many bees, let some go away. And if you didn't get enough, go back in and fill your cup. Try to get 300. Now, people will do this 10 times in a row and measure the bees, and you're going to have 305, 350, 280, whatever. Uh, good enough is perfect at, at this point, right? Just try to get a level cup if you can. And if you get more than that, that's okay. Dump them in. They're going to die. Sorry. That's just what happens. But you're sacrificing 300 bees for 50,000 if your colony is full strength. They're not going to miss them. If thousands of bees die, 1,000 bees die a day. So you're going to cap them up, and then you're going to take your container and shake the rest of the bees back in the hive. The other ones aren't going anywhere. Shake, 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 shake. And when I say shake, I don't mean shake. I mean shake. <clears throat> you really want to do whatever you can to jostle the bees. You know, if you're, if you're looking in your sample and you don't see bee legs floating, you didn't shake hard enough. You really need to shake them. And for a long time, pretend you're doing a cocktail shaker and you're going to do that singing the national anthem kind of thing. You really need to do what you can to dislodge the mites so you get a proper sample. This is what it looks like. Varroa mite are brick red in a clear container. And by the way, don't do what I do. Keep your container bottom clean. Wipe it off before you put your sample in. Make sure you clean the inside of the cup out every time. Uh, lately, if you look at my easy checks, they're crystal clear, so you don't mess this up. But there are mites in this sample, obviously. How many do I have? Seven of them. There's sometimes a big mystery to people. Well, what does that equal in percentage? You divide by three. And whatever that is, that's your percentage. So if there's seven mites divided by three, there's a 2.3 mite, 2.3% infestation. That's what the calculator tells me. So is that good or bad? That's an it depends. Because remember what I said to you, these thresholds are changing over time. There's also something they talk about as to where you are in the series in the season and how harmful this number is based on the population of bees you have in your hive. If you read the Honeybee Health Coalition, they'll tell you that at peak population, your percentage can be a little higher than if it's at a lower population. So follow their guide. That's why I'm not going to tell you this is a good number or not. I would say a lot of people anecdotally are now saying if it's above 2%, the conservative above, above 1%, or I find a mite, they're going to treat. That's the way they feel about it. The Honeybee Health Coalition is the guide for all beekeepers who want the guide. So follow their recommendations. Now, if you've never seen a Varroa mite, this is what it looks like. I took a sample. I cleaned them all out. This is one sample, by the way, how many mites in a Supreme hive. And I dumped them out on a white. They're brick red. Now, sometimes you'll find smaller ones that aren't fully developed. They're kind of cream in color. But the full-size adults are brick red. They look like this when you blow it up. But they're big enough, you'll be able to see them in that sampler. 
I promise. They have a perfect round shape where specks of dirt like this over here, that's not a veromite. It's pretty clear, right? But that one's round. So, you know, keep your container clean, but you'll be able to see. So this is what a veromite looks like blown up. And if you Google Bing a veromite, you'll see them. If you go to youtube.com slash NWNJBA, there's a video out there that universally people, I shot the video, Tim Schuler did it, about my monitoring. And he goes more in depth, how to do it, why to do it, when to do it, and so on. And it's really a great video to watch. Uh, YouTube.com slash NWNJBA, look up my monitoring, you'll find it. Tim Schuler does the demo. If you don't take care of your mites, this is your risk. This is a parasitic mite syndrome. The parasitic mite syndrome, or PMS as it's called, is just the hive itself. All kinds of things are going on, and the hive is just degraded to the point where it's not functional. There's dead larvae throughout. The brood pattern's not standard. There's a lot of dead bees, so there's low population. It, it's just an awful situation. If you open your hives in September and this is what they look like, and you didn't treat, this is this is what it boils down to eventually. So if you start seeing brood patterns that look like this, uncapped bees and other things, melted bees, it's got a strange odor. You start to develop stress and European fowl brood and so on. This is what happens when you don't treat for varroa mites. Did I make these? How did these things get on here? <laughs> That's interesting. Um, Don't see an eraser. Okay. As part of the mentoring program, if you live in Hunter and Warren as our member, we'll come out and help you. We'll come out and show you how to monitor and talk to you about treatments. When you have to make a treatment, you have to figure out what to use. There's a bunch of different products out there. And there's a triage guide in the Honeybee Health Coalition, but let me talk about a couple products just straight up, right? If you have honey on the hive, the only real choice you have is Formic Pro. You sell the precursor to that, which was Mitoway Quick Strips. Don't buy that. Buy Formic Pro. Formic Pro is a modern configuration of Mitoway Quick Strips, and Mitoway Quick Strips was really hard on the bees. Make no mistake, Formic Pro is tough. I put this picture of me wearing a mask because these products require you to have proper safety. You do not want to breathe in the acids that are coming off the Formic Pro pads. They'll do damage to your lungs. There's another product that you can use with honey called HopGuard. We don't recommend it right now. They, they're, I think they're on HopGuard 3. So far, I've yet to hear anybody say it's a great product. Some say it's okay, but most of them say it's messy to use and it's ineffective. That's my personal belief of what I've heard from people in the industry. So they're not doing it. You have to read the labels and follow the instructions and also pay attention to temperature because a lot of these things are temperature sensitive. If you came real early in a call, Sue and I were discussing Formic Pro. A lot of people take Formic Pro and they put it in the freezer because as it thaws out in your hive, it's slower to release. If you put it in on a hot day, like yesterday, it'll gas out really quickly and it is super caustic. It could kill your queen. It's going to kill all the brood. There'll be dead bees all over the place. But if you refrigerate it and follow the instructions, freeze it, 
refrigerator, keep it cold, put it in at night on the overnight when it's not going to be in the heat of the sun, you'll do better with it. So follow the manufacturer instructions and recommendations. Now, if you have honey, that's all you can do. If you don't have honey, then you have other choices. So a lot of people do their treatments now after they pull their honey in the summer. The number one treatment, I think, universally is Apivar. It's like the dog collar strips impregnated and you put them in your hive. They're easy to use, but you can't use them with honey on. Now, one of the things that I will say is factors that drive what you choose. The first one listed is rotation. If you keep using the same product all the time, any of the mites that survive that product are going to be super product, super anti-product mites, right? They're going to um, get by if you keep using the same product. But if you switch something up, you went from Apivar to Formic Pro, maybe they won't hold out to that. They'll die from the Formic Pro and you won't build super mites. That's why we want you to rotate every time you change. So there are recommendations. I think I gave it in the first presentation where you start with oxalic acid in winter time and you do Formic Pro early in the spring when your summer when your honey is on. You do Apivar touch up in the summertime when you pull your honey. If you have to, you could do Formic Pro or Epigard or something in the fall. And then in the wintertime, when they're broodless again, you do oxalic acid. There are some people who literally follow that regime. And the key there is I've rotated the products every single time. Apicard's another popular one. There's others out there like Apistan and so on. Not so commonly used in New Jersey. And, but I keep reiterating like a broken record. Follow the Varroa Tools Guide. They'll say to you, what time of year do you have honey, blah, blah, blah. What did you use last? And after you answer all those questions, you click the button and they'll say you could use this. What's the temperature outside and so on. So go use this guide. If in doubt, you can give us a call. We'll, we'll also help you with that. I'm going to move to summer management to just keep moving this along. Your, your colony, as we started out should be two deeps right now. Hopefully you got some honey supers going. They're building wax. If I start with the end in mind, I need two deeps in New Jersey. Need in air quotes. People overwinter single hives. They overwinter nuke boxes and so on. But conventionally, the standard wisdom is two Langstroth deeps to overwinter. In those two deeps, you need 30, 40,000 bees going into winter at minimum, and you need 60 pounds of honey, and it would be ideal that they have some pollen stores to get them through. That's for the mid-Atlantic region where we are. And going back to the theme earlier, you want non-parasitized bees, meaning healthy bees. So your activity in summer, hopefully you're, you've got what I just described, is to maintain that. Keep it going. Make sure your queen's doing what she's supposed to do, what she signed up to do, and protect your hive from any threats. One of the primary threats when the nectar flow falls is robbing. And if need be, they start consuming all their honey because there's no forage, you're going to feed them. I'll go through each of these things individually. And then as you monitor, if you find any problems, you correct. So let's break this down. Maintaining a healthy colony. Inspect your colony every 10 to 14 days. Looking for bias. I keep using this term brood in all stages. What does that tell you? If you see eggs and larvae, you have a queen. If the pattern looks good, you don't have to find the queen and you should have a fairly large population. You don't have to be too intrusive. The good news is in summertime, it's a good time to inspect because it's warmer. You're going to have the hive open, unlike March, where it's 60 degrees out. 
and that allows you to go through the hive. Now, I would recommend one time at minimum in the super warm days of summer, you go from the roof to the floor. You inspect the entire colony. You look at every single frame. You want to know the quality of the house. And what I mean by that is you're looking at how does the comb look? Is it in good shape? Is there a lot of drone brood? Is there any plastic frames that didn't get built out? Are there any wonky comb where there's, you know, wax blobs hanging off and things like that? If you find bad comb, you make two choices. You either replace it now and get them, feed them to get them to build it. Or what I like to do sometimes is take a bad frame, frame number three, and move it out and move it out and move it down. I'll, I'll literally sometimes move it to the outer fringe and then put it down in the bottom box. And then in this winter time, when you're coming out of winter into spring and the bees are up in the top box, you're free to go down in that bottom box and pull the comb out then and replace it when they're going to build you new comb in the spring. So one of the things I want you to do is pay attention to the quality of your comb. I have beekeepers who build really good hives, but they never really got their comb built out. Frames one and two, nine and 10 are plastic. The outside isn't built. The inside has a patch about, you know, the size of a softball. That's not living space, doesn't work. They should be fully built out from wall to wall. So pay attention to that stuff. And then you're gonna look at the brood patterns. What we said before is it shouldn't look that's a worst case scenario. It shouldn't look like that PMS frame. It should look more like the brood in all stages one where there's, you know, older larva out graduating to um, eggs and, and in a nice solid pattern. The other thing you really need to pay attention to in the summertime is robbing. Especially if your colonies, let's say you have two colonies sitting next to each other. Inherently, there's always one stronger than the other. It's just the way the world works. They're like children, they're different. If the smaller one leaves any desire for defense, the bigger one will pick on it. Because if I'm a bee coming out and I'm looking for forage and there isn't any, and there's a neighbor next door, forage is opportunistic forage. They're not being mean. They're doing what nature told them to do. If it's convenient, poorly guarded, it's forage, right? Have robber guards ready and understand how to protect against robbing. So robber guards are these screens that you can put down in front of your hive and you can close the hive off and chase the way the entrance works. They're sold in all the bee catalogs or you can make them. There's videos out on our website on how to do that on the YouTube channel. If you come out and you find your hive being robbed, take a towel, take a big sheet, throw it over the hive, hide the entrance from all the bees let things calm down and then close the entrance down to smaller entrance so the bees can defend it. You're going to want to feed your colonies if they require it. Remember 60 to 80 pounds is the end game in November and you need time for them to either take in what's coming in from nectar, ripen it, cap it and store it or whatever you're feeding them. You can't watch the colony all the way through. and get to September, October, where you had a smidge of a dearth where there was nothing available to them and they eat all the food and then you go, oh, I'm gonna feed them in October. And everything is wet. They don't get to cure it. That's not food to them or it dries out and it becomes crystallized. So you wanna make sure that you have multiple frames of capped honey in your hive. And if you don't, in the fall, summer and fall you feed them two to one i'm going to say this it gets repeated a lot it, i don't literally mean it it's a general common wisdom one to one food one part water one part sugar volume or weight is typically consumed as food two part sugar one part water is so rich in sugar density that they often store it as reserve so when you're trying to fatten them up and stimulate bees and whatever you use one-to-one -one. 
But when you're trying to get them to stash away the, the winter stores to get to 60, you feed to two to one. General rule of thumb. Now, don't go crazy feeding the bees. You've got now until October, feed them small amounts. Don't be pouring gallons on them. They will backfill and shut the queen down, which you don't want to do. I'm a fan for a pint up to a quart, not a gallon. If your hive's not normal, then obviously you have some sort of problem, okay? If the hive is too small, then why? Queen's a dud? Hive swarmed away? You can put a new queen. You can feed them. Stimulative feeding, the one-to-one -one that I just talked about. You can combine two weak hives if that's what you have. If they're not healthy, you see bad brood patterns. You see sick bees. You see deformed wing virus and any of that stuff then that should be a sign you need to monitor and treat if there's european fowl brood which if you see nasty bad like that parasitic call us that's not normal and we'll help you clean that up or try to give you guidance right but the way you fix that sometimes european fowl broods become more and more um ubiquitous. I don't know why. In the last couple of years, we have more beekeepers reporting it. I've got one hive that had it earlier this year. What did I do? I got rid of all my old comb. And European fowl brood is a bacteria disease. So when you get rid of the comb, you get rid of the bacteria. Now the bees still have the bacteria, but hopefully the future generations can clean themselves up, make new comb and solve the problem. We talked about brood in all stages. When you don't have brood in all stages, you see lots of drones. You don't see big patterns. You see poor patterns. You got a queen that's a dud. The good news is if you inspect every 10 to 14 days and you find that June, July, August, you can go get a queen. Even a virgin queen would still work because there's enough drones right now. And it will correct itself in time for fall. If you don't look in your hives over the summer because you're on vacation or doing whatever, you're just lackadaisical and you start finding a problem in September, it's hard to find a queen then. So do it now and pay attention. Now, again, I'll reiterate, I'm a big fan of having good quality comb throughout the hive. It's important because it is important for the stores and the resources and so on. When they have crappy comb, Think about it, 20 frames, and if they have three crappy frames, that's what percentage of the hive that they can't use. So, and you need to take care of that now because they're still building new bees and it requires new young bees to do wax. So go look at your comb problem and get it fixed. Now I'm gonna open the floor and say, what troubles are you having? Anybody have hives that are Trouble hives, problems not developed, didn't grow big enough, seeing things. Let's focus kind of on trouble right now. It's too hard for me to guess all the possible things that be going on. So I'll just go person by person and say, Ed, I'll go to you first. You can unmute yourself. Yeah, I have two hives. Um, both started as nukes in May. Uh, one is going gangbusters, doing really great, doing everything it should. The other one was going slower, and uh, last week I went in checks, and I didn't have any um, open brood, and everything was capped, and I had two queen cells. So evidently the queen is gone, and they're they're growing a new one. So hopefully that one will requeen and take off. Other than that, the other one's doing great. My question is, should I consider? transferring resources to the weaker hive to help it along. Um, let's just talk about queen cells. When you find queen cells on a hive that you started, it has not been out of the ordinary this year to see colonies that swarmed. They've just, just had every optimal resource availability to them this year beyond any year I think I've ever seen. So we heard a lot of people who had first year hives 
they swarmed. The other thing that happens sometimes, I'm just saying this out loud, I have no idea what your situation is. People feed their hives too much. They shut the queen down and that becomes a swarm trigger and they'll replace the queen. It is also not uncommon for a new colony to sometimes get a queen that just didn't get mated well. When all the queens are generated in the spring in Atlanta, Georgia, or wherever they come from, it's inevitable that some of them just didn't get a real good mating period. Maybe it rained a day or something like that. Your assessment of finding queen cells leads me to believe that either the queen was a daughter or it swarmed. But to your point, that will slow the colony down, obviously. It's going to take 30 days at least for that queen to go out, get mated, and to get restarted. It'll set the hive back, but new young queens tend to catch up pretty quickly. As to the answer for your question, if you have a colony that's just booming on the other side and you want to give a frame of capped brood to that, you can do that. Shake the bees off and just swap a frame with something that doesn't have too much going on. Um, you could usually take nurse bees and interchange them between colonies, but in your case, you're just looking to give them a, a boost. So, you know, be mindful that when you pull a frame out, they want it to be 90 degrees, not 70, 80 degrees, whatever your temperature is outside. So plan your operation and do it efficiently. Um, shake your bees off both sides and do a swap. Put a less than desirable, you know, contribution to your lower hive. Pull that one, put the, the capped one. You, you do want to put any contributions in the brood area. And what I mean by that is if you're going to pull a frame that is capped like the one that I showed earlier. Um, put that in the brood area. Don't put it out in position 10. You know what I mean by that, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. By all means, equalizing hives is a good way to go. Um, not a problem with that. Okay. Yeah. Forgive folks. If I over explain things, it's just so that everybody gets to play along. I use your opportunity to use it to, to just kind of describe some situations that you may see in the future or have seen already. So uh, anything else you want to ask about, talk about? Uh, no, that's pretty much it. That was my only concern was I lost that queen and uh, I'm hoping they're replacing her successfully. So got it. The, you know, the one thing you want to do is make sure that you don't have a ton of queen cells. If that hive swarmed and there's tons and tons of queen cells, then it is possible that um, the next swarm will go out and the next swarm will go out and so on. Um, so you really only want to leave them like one or two queen cells, not a, not a whole bunch of them. Some of these colonies make eight, nine, ten dozen queen cells. They'll swarm themselves to nothingness. Yeah. No, when I looked at it, I could only find two queen cells. So Okay, good. Then then you're probably good to go. Just keep an eye on it. Okay. Uh, I'd go to Sue, but it looks like she wandered off. Oh, Sue, do you have anything you want to talk about? You want me to come back to you? Jutta? Everything okay on your side? We're not hearing you. You're unmuted, but we don't hear your voice. Can you hear me now? Yep. Ah. Now we can. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I'm I'm still a little bit behind this year compared to how it was last year, but I I think it's because you know last time we met, I told you that the bear went really havoc in my hive. Mm -hmm. um, there's a bear fence around it now and like knock on wood since then he hasn't gone back but the hive was really decimated at that point and i think they're just really still recovering i put um the the super on last week because they have a lot of honey in there it seems to be i didn't see so much brood as i was used to be seeing but i really think it's just that 
they're just trying right now. And I mean, I just wanted to make sure that they're not running out of space to store the honey. That's why I haven't fed them um, much. So I don't think that I was overfeeding them. The honey that they got, they got from 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 the flowers. Um, so, but I think I think generally they are good. They are just really, I would say, probably three four weeks behind. Yeah, I hesitate to say this, but I will tell you that uh, myself and, and Bob, we, we preach this all the time, some patients. I had a hive that just could not get out of its way on my pad number one. And then I literally gave it a frame of brood with brood in all stages, hoping that they would raise a queen. And I went in the next week and there were four frames of cat brood in the thing. So <laughs> sometimes... Uh, they'll yeah. surprise you and just resurrect themselves. It's, it's hard to say how that works. So, you know, have some patience, but also be vigilant, right? If, if eventually yeah. you don't see a turnaround, then plan a course of action. Yeah, I didn't see any queen cells or so in there. So I don't think that they are planning on um, replacing it. And I'm pretty sure nothing did swarm because I mean, the bear killed so much of them already. I don't think that they actually even needed to swarm. To, to make more space. I, I will tell you that sometimes you'll see frames that look like this. They yeah. have a hole where the yeah. queen is going to lay. Have you ever seen that? That was more or less what I saw actually in two of the top frames when I went in there. Yeah. So if they have that prep, then you know that they're right around the corner. Within 20 days, you, you'll have a population. That's what I typically, when I'm a little concerned, I look for this design and if I find pockets where they just waiting for the queen to get there, then I know that the bees are clear that something's going to happen very good, you know, so. Yeah, no, but other than that, I'm fine. Okay, good, good to hear. Um, let's go to, well, I don't see Richard. I'll come back to you, Sue. Do you, do you have anything? You're, you're muted, Sue. All right, am I unmuted now? There you go. Here. Okay. Um, so I think I'm actually in a pretty good place. It's been a really up and down with my hives. Um, I started with two nukes on April 20th. Within two weeks, um, one of them had multiple queen cells. Um, so it was actually split. So then I had three colonies. Um, so the one that was split became two much smaller colonies. The other colony swarmed. Um, that was about four weeks ago now. And it's finally starting to catch up a little bit. So they've all had their, their issues. So I think they're all a little bit behind. Um, I did a mite wash, I guess it was about a week and a half ago now, only on the first two colonies, because the other one didn't really have brood yet. Mm -hmm. um, and I found mites in both of them. So I treated with Formic Pro. I actually just did this like I did the initial treatment and then the second treatment was supposed to be 10 days later. I think I did it on day 12. Um, Cause like yesterday, today, tomorrow, we're at least going to have those days um, where the temperatures aren't so bad, yeah, but so I it, still, it was perfect, right? Yeah. But I still Honestly. haven't done a mite wash on the, the third hive. I inspected it today. Um, does have um, brood in all stages. But I didn't inspect it because I think what I'll do is I'll inspect it when I do the other two hives instead of everything being on a completely different schedule. Okay. And by the way, Sue demonstrates, if you want to do your own monitoring and not wait for us, don't wait for us. Go ahead and do it. I ever, you know, thought there's plenty of information how to do it. Um, most people are a little anxious about it. Uh, 
But if you know, yeah, I was definitely it, anxious about it. And um, how you said to be so, you know, try to be careful that you get your half a cup of bees. Yeah. I was not quick enough. <laughs> so by the time I went to scoop my half a cup, I think the first one I did, I managed to barely get the half a cup. The second time, all the bees were crawling up outside, like up the sides of the tub because I wasn't quick enough. Mm -hmm. So it was um, it was pretty humorous. But I, I figured I had about 200 bees. So I just went with that because there were not enough there. Um, and I didn't want to start all over again. But other than that, um, everything is good. I actually okay. love like how they've been bearding so much when the weather's really, really hot. It's really cool to see how every hive has its different behavior when the weather gets hot. Do you see them lined up on the front entrance fanning? Some, well, the one hive, they all line up in a nice row and they fan. Yeah. On the other hive, they're underneath. And then the ones that are on the front of the hive are motionless. Like it's just two completely different. And then the other hive that um, swarmed the most recently probably just not as many bees. So then I don't really see like a whole lot of fanning or bees on the entrance or anything. If you go to our YouTube channel, the most recent one is fanning like that from the lanes off. So yeah. Okay. Sounds like you're in a good place. So yeah. I, I don't know who galaxy S nine is. You have your hand up. Um, you know, unmute and say hi and tell me if you got anything to, to ask. It's me, it's Lisa. I had to switch devices. My oh, iPad okay. kept freezing, so I'm in, I'm on my phone now. Okay. Um, I sent you guys an email um, because something's going on with my one hive, and I'm not sure. I, I try to inspect them every 10 to 12 days. That's my goal, but we've been having a lot of rain, so it was a little hard. But um, my one hive, I think, is queenless. This is the fourth time I've gone in. And I have not like this, the, the previous times I thought I saw some larva and I, thought, I was like, okay, maybe she's here and I'm just missing her. But now there's none. There's, um, I sent you a picture of one that had some in the corner, but there's like massive gaps in that frame. There's dead bees and it's bad. Okay. And they're very nasty. I've never, I've been around bees for a lot of years and I have to say the past two days I, was the most I've ever been stung in my entire life. Yeah. Bees when they're queenless are not happy bees. <laughs> no, no, so. they were my poor son. He got stung at least five times yesterday trying to help me. And um, so I'm almost certain that it's queenless. And you mentioned before about the frames. And I almost want to blame my son, but I don't because I feel bad. But I think when he goes and grabs the frames, he's too aggressive. And I always mm -hmm. tell him, be gentle. Um, but some of the wax, like there's clumps of wax. There's in the top of the frames. I have holes now. But the one picture that I sent you guys the other day, this is in the center. There's like massive gaps. And I'm Where not did, sure. Sorry, I didn't see these messages. Where did you send them? On Facebook or through? Uh, no, uh, the live.com email. I sent it to an email. Okay. I'm going to have to check the spam because I didn't see them come through. Okay. But Dave or Bob, did you guys see any? I did not. I'll take a look. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll take a look. Where are you located, Lisa? I'm in Warren. Um, and I would love to have you guys come out and see, but right now, my kids are all being uh, tested because they're all, they're all very sick. Um, I would be open to like a zoom call or something like that where I could go in and have you guys on video or something like that. But it's just, I'm not sure what to do at this point, if it's even re worth replacing frames because it's a lot that are messed up Okay. and I'm not well, sure what happened. It's, it sounds like we need to have a consult with you. So we'll, we'll reach out. Oh, I okay. see you're in the junk mail. Sorry. Oh, yeah, it's okay. It, I just found your message. Hopefully you haven't said a bunch of them. <laughs> no, it's just that one. 
I figured maybe you guys were waiting uh, today. Same thing on to Tuesday. It. I see it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's in the junk mail, Dave and Bob. Okay. We'll, okay. we'll get back to you, Lisa. Okay. Thank you. Uh, somebody will write back through email and we'll make some arrangements for you. Okay. Okay. Um, we're going to go to Ron. You want to unmute yourself and just let us know how you're making out over there? Now go there. Uh, let me see if I can. I saw your message, uh, Ron. I'm going to beg off going to Bridgewater. Uh, I have to be really careful about making exceptions because I know there's people in Bernardsville, there's people in, you know, other places, Mercer County and so on. <laughs> they keep asking for us to come through. And if we did make one exception, we'd end up being to all corners of the state. We literally had somebody from Putin or one of those places over by New York City asking if we would come out and consult with them. And I, we just, I don't think it's fair for our beekeepers to drive out to New York City and stuff. So um, we could, however, see if we can find someone. You're in the um, area for Raritan Valley. Yeah, I belong to Raritan Valley, Kev. Um... But I do have three beekeepers, one being a master beekeeper, Chris Miller. Yeah. So she lives Chris is like a block away. And then Lucy um, lives like three houses away. And I have Pete Vick. So okay. they've all been to my house and, and they've all been to the hive. So uh, that wasn't my, I was only asking that since I'm on, I belong to the club. I just was almost going to ask, don't, don't bother coming out to the. Uh, okay. Yeah. You know, okay. We appreciate that. Because yeah. again, it's. You know, it's not, uh, we almost just have to draw the line as you. Yeah, I understand. understand. I understand. So any, any problems wrong then? Sounds like you, you're in good hands over there. I'm in good hands. I Pete came over the other day and he, he made me take my uh, second box off because he said the first box wasn't really filling, uh, filling up enough. Yeah. So I took that off and I continue to feed them mm -hmm. um, with an internal feeder. So I'm going to okay. check, I'm going to check them tomorrow. Um, and then see how it goes. And he took a, um, a, a honey super, and he's going to comb it out for me. He said so. Maybe oh, I'll that's good of him. Yeah, that's a nice. Jump on it. So, uh, one question I have is: It seems like the plastic um, frames, they're not. They are going on. You know, they're 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 building on them. But should I, if they're not building out as much as they should, should I just put in uh, a wax? frame in? Would that be better than have? This is me putting my Kevin hat on. I don't okay. like plastic. <laughs> I for that reason, um, sometimes the bees absolutely love them. Talk to the commercial people; they use them. They're convenient. They extract well. They do whatever. But my sensibility is, unless you're under a really good nectar flow, mm -hmm. it's sometimes hard to get them to build. And I can't tell you how many beekeepers we visit, and I see. That's why I went on that diatribe earlier. I see all this half-assed comb that's not good. And almost universally, and I won't say they don't build on wax because sometimes they don't or they build it bad, but for every one of wax, I see nine of plastic. So if you're struggling, especially as we get into summer, they're not going to build on plastic. Now, plastic comes in a bunch of different forms. And even if you go to Man Lake, they have different depths of wax on the plastic and all of that other stuff. Um, the other thing it has to do with plastic is how it's stored. Some of it could be stored for a long time and then the bees don't want to build on it. Um, if you're not having success, switch the to wax. And my bet is you'll do better with it. Personal okay. thought. Yeah. Um, but feeding them is important. Now, bees, when they get to a certain age, like six years old, six days old after, that's when they develop their wax glands. And if you don't have a constant refresh of new bees emerging that that are going to get in that right temperature zone. So the right thing that they told you to do is collapse down to one hive. They need to have a lot of heat and they need to have a lot of young bees to build wax. 
But there's still enough forage and nectar flow out there right now that you should be able to build out that wax. Just get them the right conditions. And, you know, if you if it makes you, uh, you know, sensibility wise better to build and you can do it, I put wax in. OK, OK, I, I have yeah, you want to offer could, something there. I could, Yeah, I could swap them out. That's not a problem. Yeah. Good. Thank you. <clears throat> OK. Uh, Anthony, you're up. Any troubles hey. or any problems? Can you hear me all right? Yeah. Um, so just to give you some background, I started with a package this year. Um, things are looking pretty good. I have Laura from the Northwest. She's coming out tomorrow, actually, and we're going to do a mite check. Good. Um, I did find some small hive beetles, and I uh, put in a little beetle blaster, um, but it seems like the bees are managing it all right. No issues there. Um, one question I do have, though, is I do have a entrance reducer still in, and the entrance does seem pretty packed. Um, it's on, I guess, the three inch. Should I remove it altogether um, or just like leave it? Big? Yeah, if you have a double deep pot. Yes. Full of bees, yeah, remove it. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty packed. Um, I wouldn't say it's, uh, I mean, I have nothing really to compare it to. Um, it doesn't look like the, you know, the colony is going crazy. Um, cause I, I think it just started with, you know, nothing. So, uh, yeah. But let's talk about the dynamic of, a of when to remove an entrance reducer. Obviously in the winter time, when the bees are, are clustered, you, you have an entrance reducer on because they're not going to defend the entrance. Even in the early spring, when you have the cold nights and they come in and cluster, you want to have an entrance reducer. When you start to get into early to mid spring and the trees are in flowering and you have a big colony, you don't want to hamper their egress, ingress, right? So that's where you can remove it. As long as you see active flight during the day, you can remove that. When you have a population, I'm assuming of two count, two boxes, your population is big enough that they can defend themselves. If you observe something where they're not defending themselves and they're having robbing and whatever, but even in the nectar flow, if the colony was small enough and they didn't do the greatest job defending them, there's so much food out there that they're not going to attack that hive. Now we're getting to the period, and I will tell you how I know this. We extracted honey early in the season. I want to say March or April. And I have this tray that has all the comb with the cappings. I put it out hoping the bees would clean up the, you know, excess honey. They haven't touched it. <laughs> Only this past couple of weeks that they just start to come in and get interested in that. So when that's going on, they're not going to rob your hive. And if you open the entrance, you're affording the best, you know, unencumbered fetch of resources. They're going to go out and they'll fly right back in. If they all got to navigate the hole, then... You're just slowing them down. Yeah, and my concern too was with keeping it on, keeping it on was almost forcing them to uh, swarm. So, yeah. It also, you know, if they're trying to dry the nectar and whatever, it's it's sometimes a little harder for them to get the moisture out of the hive, depending on what your setup is and so on. So, yeah, once they're the rule of thumb, Tim Schuler taught us this. Once they're actively flying, and you can see some of the bees paroling the entrance you can remove that they'll take care of things and when we get a little later in summer and you start to see yellow jackets and other things probing the hive or so this is i want to talk about this because you might see this before we get to our next session if the bees are robbing it looks like this they're looking for any way to get in the hive and robber bees don't come in like, you know, a plane trying to land on the deck of a aircraft carrier because they're full of honey. They dart through the entrance as quickly as possible to get past the guards. When you see them around the back trying to find holes and doing all that and they're flying back and forth and, you know, being aggressive, they're robbing the high. When you see that activity, you got to close things down. So stand at your entrance today during a normal flow. Watch the bees come and go and see what that looks like. Then later, if you do see a robbing situation, you'll recognize the different pattern of flight of bees that fly up 
they look for a second and you see them they they try to bonsai into the hive once they get past the guard nobody stops them right but if you have an entrance reducer where they have to land and go through the hole and they get checked then you're good to go or robbing screen so look now be really take the time to look at the entrances of your hives and especially during the day my hives are in the woods and there's times when the sun comes through a hole and shines on the hive and they all come out and they do orientation flights and it looks different it looks almost like they're swarming and then the sun comes off that hive and it shines on the next one and they come out and all those other ones go in so you'll see different patterns but robbing looks pretty distinct right like you see the bees just constantly they're looking like like a boxer trying to you know land a punch they want to get in so um sounds like you're good and i'm laura is one of our mentors so i'm glad she's coming to check you out and um i'm assuming that would suffice as your mentor visit so but if you need anything else you give us a ring great thank you um richard come to you next Hello. There you go. We can hear you. Hey. How are you making out, Richard? Oh, uh, pretty well. Pretty well. Um, I put an extra super on since since our phone conversation, and uh, they're uh, prospering nicely. Good. Good. So everything's uh, good to go there. Um, I I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly hope so, uh, which brings me to the mentor program. Yeah. We, we'll, uh, I, I think I got, is Becky, I don't know which Becky there's. We have a Becky that's a mentor, so. Hi, uh, the Becky Hoax is my name. <laughs> okay, you're not the other Becky. Okay, so Richard, I'll get to that in just a second. I think Becky's the last one, unless I missed anybody. So Becky, let's let's hear what you have going on and then we'll talk. My last slide is about mentor visits. So Okay, so I have two hives and um, last summer I caught a swarm and they overwintered really well. They overwintered in two deeps in a shallow and um, they were really, really full. And I think I was kind of waiting. I was afraid of chilling the brood, but I think I waited too long. I think they swarmed. Mm -hmm. um, because there was a lot of cold weather and I, I did the split in um, like May 1st, but okay. um, so when I did the split, um, it had already it, two different frames had cap queen cells. Um, so basically I left one in the hive and then I put another in another hive, but there were a lot of uncapped queen cells. Yeah. And I didn't know that you need to look inside them or destroy most of them. So when I did the split, um, I think the new, the new hive that I made just kept swarming because there more queens emerged. And I talked to Bob about this. Um, okay. So that, that basically in like five days, like they were a good thriving hive and then they just all disappeared. <laughs> they all, so they're, nothing in it now or they absconded yeah. or yeah they absconded they're totally uh, gone that's a bummer yeah so that split did not work I have to get rid of the extra queen cells that was my lesson <laughs> yeah um but on that hive i have a sh the, the shallow and that's full of nectar and it's been full of nectar for a while and it's like a little bit capped but um it seems like it's it's capable, but they don't, they, they didn't cap it as of a week ago. Um, I reserved the extractor through the club because I wasn't sure how I was going to extract it. Um, I'm involved in the 4-H hives too, so there might be something happening with that. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody might be doing a demo of extraction, but um, so I don't, with the bee equipment, like the extractor, um, like I don't really have any extracting equipment. I guess the I guess the bucket with the gate is the most essential. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have little scrapers, you know, like the little hand scrapers. Um, the picker. Yeah. Okay. 
that's that's really all you need. Um, a lot of people can get away with just using an uncapping tool is what that's called. Okay. Um, if you go to our website, look up honey harvesting or our YouTube. Mm -hmm. I did a video on everything you want to know about that. And yeah. it shows how to use the extractor. Um, you know, if you if the time comes that your slot is up for extractor use and your, your stuff's not capped, you can call them and tell them to reserve a different time. Okay. Generally, because we have two of them, you know, if you call within a week or two, you can get on the schedule. Okay. Yeah, it seemed like they were they were pretty much open. So um but the other thing is that somebody said that they've heard from a few different people is that you can extract it when it's not fully capped if you hold it like horizontal and it's not dripping out and then yeah. like i'm not selling it it's just for me so i just i don't want to go too far into july and then they start using that and then like there's nothing left to extract you know what i mean so Help me follow the situation. You had a hive that absconded. They left honey behind. Okay, so I, I'm sure. sorry. And you moved so that had, to another colony. So I, I have the my hive from last summer that right. was a swarm. So I did a split. the The split didn't work, but the main mother hive has that shallow on it. Okay, that shallow is on the main mother hive. Yeah, I, I would so. let them be. I, I have a bunch of colonies right now that are in the same state, and sometimes. When the dearth comes, they end up capping all that stuff in like a week or two. It's usually mid to late July. They okay. do one of two things. <laughs> they either cap it or they eat it. I don't know which one you're going to end up with. Uh, as right. far as extracting honey that's not capped, to talk about that, risk-wise, you're right. If you tilt the honey over and you give it a shake, and it's honey, it's not nectar, it's ripened honey. So what I mean by that is they've dried that nectar enough and provided it with inoculation of enzymes and whatever that it's transformed the honey. And you could usually look in the cell, it's sunken, it's glassy, it's thick, it's viscous. If you pull out a frame that has nectar in it, you could usually tell it's wet, it's right up to the top edge of the cell, it's not ripe visually you can see now the risk you run of extracting honey that's not capped is that in due time it could have too much moisture and ferment so if you've extracted that honey honey it's not capped but it's probably ripened enough to be called honey then and you probably don't have one but you could take a sample and see how much water is in it and if it's below a certain threshold, you're good. And if it's above, then you need to either consume it or give it back to the bees or make mead with it or something. So can I put it in the refrigerator and and store it like that or the freezer? Like if I just wanted to use it for myself, but it what it might ferment if it's left at room temperature. Yeah, all the all the honey and, and whatever that's not ripened have yeasts. And if it's up to a certain water percentage above 17%, 18% into the 19, 20, it's going to eventually ferment. Um, Kevin, can yeah. I jump in for a second? Yeah, please, Bob. So, uh, so Becky, I have uh, the club refractometer. So if you're going to extract it, you know, give me a call and we can test it and see what the water content is. Okay make sure that it's safe, that it's not gonna ferment. But I also would agree with Kevin, um, we still have a decent flow going. So I would leave it at least for a couple more weeks and right. see if they don't cap it. Okay, I had it reserved for like the 4th of July, just because I thought that when I, um, Josie was my neighbor and so he would always extract like the beginning of July and then he'd treat with formic acid yeah. the middle of July. So that I kind of am just keeping with what, you know, he kind of did because that's just what I know. <laughs> um, but I guess I, I didn't realize that people already extracted last month and that they're extracting at all times. It just depends, I guess, on what they feel like where, when their honey's ready. Yeah, I mean, some people had reserved from last year that the bees just still hung on to. Some people got done early. 
one thing you do is look at the actual cell. If they're getting prepped to cap it, they usually build a ring around the outside of the cell and then they start to build it in and you can see the coloration of the new wax and you know your capping is imminent and then be patient. Okay. As okay, much as so they'd like to follow your 4th of July schedule, they may <laughs> not be on the same calendar. <laughs> that's the way the world works. No, yeah, so. that's okay. I mean, I'm fine keeping it to a different time I just kind of shot in the dark and um, and then I had put another honey super on top of that just for them to build out the comb on yeah yeah I've been that doing shallow that is full yeah and there's so, the, the and, lindens are out the you know there's different trees that bloom this time of year mm -hmm. and there's also like I have a, a magnolia that's in full bloom and the bees are all over it so there's still, to Bob's point, forage out there right now. And the white clover is really coming into its own. So mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, just let it run its course. We've okay. talked about all your hives. What actually, uh, the, I have another hive. Yeah, go ahead. So um, just around on the time when I had done that other split, I actually caught another swarm. <laughs> okay, yeah, it was a good year for that. Yeah, so it was not far from my hives, but it was a week after I did the other split. Um, after, because I had always heard that once th those queen cells are capped, that they're flying right away or they've already flown. So these were capped when I did the split. And then it was a week later that I found um, like about 30 feet away from the hives. On one of the trees. So I don't, I assume it was one of mine, but I, I don't really know. But um, so then I put that in a box and they're, and they built out the first box and I, I supered it um, like a few weeks ago because I didn't, I didn't want there to be a problem, but they didn't really, I built, a, I, I brought up two frames from the bottom and put them in the center on the top box. Mm -hmm. But I think I did it a little early because they totally stopped building out that bottom box. Like they didn't really touch that uh, first and the 10th. Yeah, they'll get to them. They but won't. they were working. So should I move them in? Like, should I kind of cycle things into the middle to try? I was afraid that they might swarm if they're like the center of the hive is so full and then the end doesn't have comb and then they start wanting to go up you start you know? to see this pattern let me see if i can explain this to you is that there's cap brood throughout the bees emerge and the population gets to a certain threshold queen goes through and lays throughout the hive then you go through your hive and you find frame three four five six all cap brood all of a sudden you have this population explosion and the, and the colony goes from this big to this big and to this big through the cycles. Eventually one of those gets enough bees that they get to these areas that maybe they didn't touch. So if you're patient, um, these will continue to, to grow new colonies through to the end of July. So just keep let them, let them have time. Uh, eventually they'll get to those areas if you put you did i guess what the picture showed right you pull two frames and you put them up right so i guess um, it's whole pyramiding i put two from the bottom that were yeah. like prime and then i put them in the top okay i saw your message Jonah. Yeah. um so let me just say this real quick i'm going to put you on hold before we lose anybody and then i'll come back um the mentoring program let me switch my frame, hold on. This is the email address, nwnjba at live.com. If you're in Hunterdon and Warren County, send a message to that saying you want to visit. But what I do is I take the list of people where you're at, and I go to my pool of mentors and ask them to contact you and make arrangements. Ideally, we want to do this the first or second week in July. So when you send the email, tell us where you live, what your hive situation is, how many hives you have. Tell us whatever you can do to help us find you, like your street address, red mailbox, kind of house, and so on. And let me 
tell you what we'll do. We want you to have one of those Varroa easy check devices that I mentioned earlier. Okay. So if you don't have one, please buy one. We'll come with one just in case. We will come and do a hive inspection with you. When I say we, you, <laughs> will do a hive inspection. That's not us being mean. We'd like to watch you do a hive inspection and we'll gently look over your shoulder and give you any guidance and advice to help you be more efficient and comfortable with hive inspections. We'll look at every frame and just kind of let you ask whatever questions you want and point out what you have going on in the hive. While we're there, we'll take a mite sample and we'll tell you what your threshold is. We'll discuss with you treatment options. Um, you have to forgive me, I missed the last exact meeting, but typically what happened in the past is we actually bought Formic Pro with us. And if you needed a treatment, we would go through that or help you. Actually, I'm sorry, it was Apovar. Um, and if you didn't have honey supers or whatever, we would help you put Apovar on your hives. Uh, by the time we come out to see you, I'll let you know whether that's going to be an option or not. But, you know, at minimum, we'll come out and do some monitoring, and then you should plan to buy treatments if that is your destiny. Um, whoever makes arrangements to come and see you will call you, and if you have anything you want to discuss with them, say for example you're having trouble lighting your smoker or whatever that may be and you want to cover that particular topic let them know ahead of time so that they could prep anything that they need to know to come visit you we try to send you a mentor and somebody else to go tag along with them and the typical mo from the mentors goes one of two ways some mentors go out one day and they go from place to place to place throughout the day and they schedule and others will say, I'll come see you Monday, I'll come see them on Wednesday, I'll go see the other person on Friday, whatever they want to do, that's their call. We just try to do it within a window so that we can get all the reports back and collate the responses. Um, the, the one other thing about the mentors coming out and visiting is they have bees too. Uh, so you know, there's times when the weather doesn't cooperate, and I just ask you to be patient with them. As much as I'd like to tell you we're supposed to do this in early July, there's been times when I know I went out to Bloomsbury one time to check on somebody, and when I got there, it started raining, and it was cold, and the person had some family emergency, and we called the thing off, and we didn't get back to them after trying to make arrangements till like, early August. Go with the flow. Um, and in the meantime, we'll give you whatever guidance and advice you need to get you bridge you through. But hopefully everything works out. They just come visit you on a date and life is good. Um, if you are out of our area, Hunter and New Warren, you could send us a note. We know all the surrounding clubs. We actually, some of us belong to them. And, you know, if you need a visit, we might be able to send a note over to say Chris Miller that was mentioned earlier from Raritan Valley and say, Hey, Chris, this person could use a visit. Anybody have a chance? We, we've been in communication with all our surrounding clubs. They know of our program and, you know, they're watching what we're doing as a pilot and stuff. So uh, they have sent people out to uh, places. In fact, some of them have actually come into like Tewksbury, which is in Hunterdon County and help people. So we're all, we're all there to assist the situation. So, Send an email to that email address with your name. Tell us where you live, what number of hives, what you want out of the visit. Give us whatever guidance we can to find your house. And if you have anything special you want to talk about, let us know. Um, and then we'll come and we'll have a couple things to, to talk to you about. This is the last slide in the deck. Now it's uh, go to the order. <laughs> We, we've kind of gone through each of your situations, but um, I actually have a question if anybody cares to share. Maybe you don't have it. Anything interesting happened this year that you didn't count on or went was harder or easier than you thought it was going to be? I was just curious as to if uh, anybody had any experiences they wanted to share. I know, Richard, you and I were talking about some things that you had going on and um, you know, we can all learn from each other. Um, so just curious. 
I had a hard answer. time figuring out when to do the split because the weather was kind of cold and I um, in mid April, but mm -hmm. I know that you said on one of the meetings that you don't do it until like the very beginning of May or because you're in a cold area. Um, right. Mm -hmm. So I kind of was watching that and I was waiting, even though I kind of felt like I have a lot of bees and I'm starting to see more drones and <laughs> And they're really busy and but i didn't and then there was like a gap where i didn't get in there and then bang it was well that's that's a key learning rate when you see the drones usually 10 20 days after the drones appear the queens want to go out because the drones are now ready to be mated so if in a season weather notwithstanding you see drones appear and you want to do a split know that you're now in the window where the hive could swarm because as soon as they have drones they have one of the key things one of the the capital t h e key things they need to swarm which is boys so they they could possibly be there and you've got to be on top of being inside that colony whether or not withstanding and go check them so yeah good that's a good share yeah, I was so scared of the chilled brood, but I mean, what I heard somebody else say is that you're kind of either way you're running a risk. Either yeah, you're, you're damned if you do, and you're damned if you don't. Right? This is a funny year too because the bees built out so strong early on. Right? We saw it everywhere. Everybody's hives were booming, and as soon as that first weather broke, man, poof, there were swarms everywhere. I was getting three, four calls a week sometimes. So, you're you're. That not a reflection on you. It's just a reflection of the type of year it was. That would be my sensibility. I think Bob, you could back that up. How many storm calls did we get? March, April. It yeah, was once, off the once chain. The weather turned warm. Yeah. And I again, this was the kind of year that I've seen uh, people split their hives, and then I've seen uh, the hive with the original queen swarm anyway from the from the split. So it. It was that kind of year. Yeah, crazy. Yeah, I had a monster hive over winter that swarmed twice. So I doubled the size of my apiary, a modest, tiny backyard thing from two to four. And all four of them are as strong as I've ever had. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a crazy year. I felt it was interesting. I felt like it was this puzzle. I was trying to figure out this puzzle of what was happening with the bees. <laughs> yeah. When you figure that out, you let us know. <laughs> right? That's the way it goes. Well, look, um, I hope that this early summer catch up full grown to what comes next made sense to you if there's anything you had questions on that we didn't cover or you think about send us a note uh, i will schedule sorry for the like last minute thing on this but life has just been absurd lately um you know to the point of having too many bees i think i have 17 colonies outside just catching all these swarms it's been crazy this year uh, I don't know wow. what's going to happen when I physically have to go back to the office, <laughs> but it's been fun. <laughs> so uh, I, I thanks for everybody for coming out. There is a recording here. Uh, if you ever want to see the recording, give a yell. We'll probably, my suspicion is because of the short notice on this meeting, my fault. Um, some others will be there. And if you're not opposed to anything that you've said, I'm going to post this up to our YouTube channel for people to watch. Um, round Robin, uh, and also I just want to ping Bob and Dave, anything going on in the club that I, I'm going to ask one thing <laughs> not related to the mentoring program, but kind of related. There's a lot of folks that are behind the scenes working on this when they come out to visit you and whatever you benefit from the club. It's the only commercial I'll ever give you. The Warren County Fair and the Hunterdon County Fair is coming up. Not only would it be great for you to help us out by supplying, you know, some volunteer time to go work the fairs, because that's how we raise our money to pay for the stuff that we use to run the program. But universally, anybody that attends a fair will tell you one of the best things you could do is 
go to the ferret stand with Bob and I for a day, or Jim, Jim McCauley, you know, Alice Casey of whatever, stand with the, another one of these new beekeepers and chat. And you just get to talk all day long while you're putzing around in the fair booth about what's what. It's a really enjoyable experience also to chat with people about bees and it's fun. It's a fun time. So you'll see the signups for the Warren County Fair, which is a beautiful fair um, coming out and be posted on our webpage. Please do what you can to give back and, and volunteer for that in the Hunterdon County Fair if you can. Uh, and I'll put that away and just say to Dave and Bob, anything you guys want to uh, mention club business or, or related to this mentoring thing we missed? Nothing, nothing really to add. The fairs, we really could use your help. We're excited because we were fairless last year. So we're excited that we can participate in both yeah. fairs this year. That's a big deal. Um, and you can get T-shirts and stuff like that. We have some pretty cool stuff. Um, but it's also an incredible learning experience um, just to share notes and experiences and seek advice. Um, other than that, no, uh, shout out to Kevin and a big thanks on behalf of um, Northwest for the mentoring program. We take our mission statement really seriously and we're all about outreach, which Bob oversees and education um so it is our pleasure but also our mission um to be here for you and to spread the word that we need more beekeepers and we're here to help you and to teach you and to give you your own legs to stand on so you can do what we're doing to you when you're ready you can mentor someone else so it's an ongoing thing and we really appreciate your participating in it and at some point we hope that you'll be in a position to do the same for the next group of newbies. So, and Kevin, thank you so much. Uh, my pleasure. And, and I will say to echo this, I, mean, I got mentored by Stan Wozniczowski and Charlie Ilsley and a host of others before me. That's how I got to where I'm at. Um, you know, and but Bob and I are friends in beekeeping forever. And we literally hang out all the time and learn from each other and, I will reiterate what I've said in the past. A beekeeping buddy is a great resource to have. So these are your peeps here. Uh, you know, get to know each other. I'm I'm excited because we're going to get back to hopefully in-person meetings where you can talk to each other and say, "Hey, I live around the corner from you." You know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, thanks, David, for that. Yeah, and and also um, for those of you who received our email tomorrow night, we have a really exciting program. Um, on Zoom um, with Corey Stevens. I think it's next week, next Thursday. Is it? Oh, it's tomorrow. Oh no, it's tomorrow. I yeah. About that. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. my time. This guy is amazing. Yeah, you need you need to come he, see. Him. Like he's so into it. And if you have any Varroa questions and want to expand your knowledge about queen rearing and and selective breeding and varroa resistance and preening. And um, I can't wait. It's, I'm really excited that we, we got him to, uh, and he made a presentation. He's not just throwing out boilerplate. He custom tailored a presentation just to meet our needs. It's something we discussed with him. And uh, so I urge you to participate. It'll be a great learning experience. Yeah, and, and it's gonna be, um... You know, a little bit of an advanced session, but you you probably have heard about varroa sensitive hygiene bees, and I wonder what that was all about. This guy's going to give give you all that you want to know. If you even get ten percent of what he's saying, it'll 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 deepen your passion for what we all are doing. It's there's yeah. the rabbit hole is as deep as you want it to be. I mean, and he's deep in it. So, yeah, yeah. Good, good call on that. Sorry, I didn't realize it was tomorrow night. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank that. That's all I have. Thank you guys very much for we're we're proud to be working with you guys. Yep, and when we wanted to finish before nine o'clock, and it's three minutes. I'll hang out as long as anybody wants. Uh, I just wanted to give Bob. Bob, did you want to say anything? I don't want to put you on the spot, but no. But hang on, I want to talk to you for a minute. Okay. Um.
I'm going to stop the recording. And like I said, you, I'm really happy that you came out. I appreciate you spending time with us and uh, do send a message in and, and we'll be in touch with you. And if you have any questions, let us know. We'll help support you. And Lisa, um, we'll look at that email you have going on and and uh, somebody will reach out to you. Oh, um, Kevin, I sent you a text. If you just want to respond to me offline, that'd be fine. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I was having trouble getting into the account. So, yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. Thanks. Yep. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Okay, thank you. Bob, you